Signing in, that's great. Uh, our meeting started, so if we could keep it down, the noise down, it carries pretty far in here. Excuse me, we don't have enough sign in sheets. We've exhausted them. Okay, I'll get you some more, please. Thank you. That's never a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. This is the uh, September 10th Gee, Planning and Zoning Commission hearing. Uh, it's an open public meeting. It's being tape recorded and videotaped by the city. And that reminds me, if you'd all make certain to, to shut your cell phones down during the meeting. Uh, these proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media, the public, local cable and or radio stations and may be rebroadcast. Number of commission members present is six, five. five. Wow. And it will require four votes for any action today. All parties wishing to be heard on an issue are required to raise their hand and we will recognize you and ask you to come to the podium and state your name and address. Please turn off your cell phones or any other electronic devices, and we welcome you here today. Thank you. I've got a couple of people I want to mention here. Certainly the commission to start from to my left is Len Scarmato and Terry Marshall. Down the other end we have Commissioner um, David Stringer and George Sheets. <coughs> I'm Ken Maberak. Tom Menser is not here today, <coughs> nor is uh, Joe Gardner. Uh, we have a couple people in the audience I'd like to mention, some elected officials. We have our uh, outgoing mayor, Mayor Marlon Kirkendall. We have our council, our planning and zoning commission liaison member, uh, Mr. Lamerson. We have uh, somebody got a hold of the county because we have two <laughs> county supervisors here today. <laughs> we have uh, su supervisor, please, folks. We have Supervisor Craig Brown and Supervisor uh, Roley Simmons. If I missed anybody, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I wish I can't see all the people right now. <clears throat> um, we're going to start uh, the agenda here by just running through it. The, the largest item is going to be our last item. So rest easy. We've got a couple items before to get those through. Since I think the last item is going to be the most uh, uh, talked about item. And thank you for bearing with us with that. Uh, we have our first regular item, and that is the approval of the minutes of the July 10th, 2015, and the August 27th, 2015 yeah. minutes. Yeah, I move to approve the July 10th and August 27th meeting minutes. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. Aye. Opposed? Those minutes are approved. Our first item today is a revision of a plat of Prescott Heights. Uh, let me get my act in order here now. It's a, it's a revision of the plat to subdivide one parcel, lot seven, into two parcels. And um, we're going to have uh, Frank Hall from the Planning Department <coughs> lead us on that discussion. Frank? Good morning, members of the Planning Commission, Mr. Chairman. That's correct, sir. This is a re revision of plat 15003, which is a revision of plat of Prescott Heights 5th subdivision to subdivide lot 7 into two lots. The zoning is single family 9, and after the subdivision is complete, the minimum lot size and zoning requirements will still be met. The location of the parcel, outlined in red, is located between Demers and Campbell Avenue. The existing home on the site will be 
on the larger parcel, which after the subdivision will look like this. So the outer boundary of that, of that survey is the whole parcel today and a new line of division angled right approximately through the middle of the property. So the house, the existing house will be on the right side and the new vacant parcel will be on the left side there. Um, there will be no nonconformities created as part of this subdivision and all zoning requirements would be, are met. As you know, the Prescott Heights subdivision was created back in 1956, but because it's adding a new lot to the community, to the subdivision, we have to take it through uh, planning commission approval or recommendation and then city council approval. It is only one lot. It will be served by city, city public water and sewer. And uh, that's really the sum of this whole little project. The motion we would recommend approval, but if there's any questions or discussions, I'm certainly here for that. Uh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, Frank, I have a question. Are there any setback requirements? Yes, sir. New building to be put in there? Yes, sir. It'll be the standard zoning setback since this is not a PAD. It's SF9 setbacks, I believe, or nine feet on the sides and 25 front and rear. And the existing house? The existing house is, that. meets that now. Okay. Frank, I want to note that on your uh, summary, you call it 613 Prescott Highlands Drive. I want to correct that to be Prescott Heights Drive. I Thank you, sir. Just in case there was an issue with that. Um, Commissioners, any other questions? No, uh, the only thing I'd like to point out is that uh, by taking and subdividing this lot, both lots are still going to be well in excess of the 9,000 square foot, which is allowed in single family nine zoning. That's correct, sir. So, <clears throat> nothing unusual. One of them is almost 20,000, the one on the left, and 29,000 of the one on the right. Okay. Um, this is an item that we can vote on today. I yes, sir, it is. And it's not part of the public hearing? No, sir. Uh, Chair would entertain a motion to approve this. Yeah, I can do that. Um, move to approve RP15-003, the revision of plat of Lot 7, Prescott Heights, 5th Subdivision. We have a second. I second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved unanimously. Our next item on our agenda today is a uh, special use permit. I find it quite interesting, but uh, it really doesn't matter. It's a special use permit for a cellular tower array uh, on top of the room store at uh, Gateway Mall. And uh, Frank, I see you're heading up, uh, you're the planner on this one too. Could you talk a little bit? Yes, sir. This is an interesting project in the, for cellular communications in the fact that it is on the roof of the room store, but it's not a tower. It is simply the concealment of antenna, antenna uh, on each corner of the room store with the equipment on the northwest corner. Everybody knows the room store as being there at Gateway, Walt Gateway Mall um, near 69, on the corner of Route 69. Pretty prominent site. But what's great about this per, uh, particular special use permit is that it's completely concealed behind the parapet or facade of the room store. There is no pole or lattice tower or anything like that. Our code requires, even though it's not a tower, our code, land development code requires that all cellular communication be approved through a special use permit, which requires the public hearing, which is why we're here today. The antenna will be hidden behind radio frequency friendly material, and we did not have normal notification situations on this because there are no residential units within the normal 300-foot radii of sending out notices. So we sent out notices, uh, Darla did, way across on Yavapai Hills. So we sent out, I think, 80-some notices because we had to reach out further to get residential and business input.
to date, I have not received uh, any phone calls against or written correspondence either against this project. I did receive one phone call where the, a neighbor, a community resident in Yavapai Hills questioned why they even got the notice in the first place since it's pine concealed. <laughs> but um, it was done just because our code requires it and we went beyond the limits for notification. I don't know if the teen mobile representative is here today. He is in the back, so if we have any questions for him, uh, certainly he's here, and I can certainly help answer questions, sir. We would recommend um, a motion in favor. Thank you, Frank. Um, actually, <clears throat> Mike, I had uh, very few questions, there, but, but I would like to hear from the representative of T-Mobile in reference to the uh, concealment and this radio frequency material. If you could just explain that to us so that the public knows that one, <clears throat> this will be completely concealed and just what radio frequency and who are they listening to? Good morning, uh, Good morning. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Declan Murphy, representing T-Mobile. Uh, my address is 1525 North Hayden Road, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, to answer your question, Mr. Chairman, so um, the antennas which T-Mobile are proposing will be kind of um, made part of the parapet of the existing room store building. So in order for the uh, antennas to propagate through that, we use a, an RF-friendly material that basically with color and texture, we can match the existing building to allow the antennas to be able to operate. So from a layman's perspective, it'll look like it's part of the building. Um, nobody will know that the antennas are there or the equipment is there, but it will allow the site to actually um, to function. As it, as, it, as it needs to, so. And it's completely uh, concealed from the public? Absolutely, yes. It's below the parapet wall? It is, and it'll be textured and colored to match the parapet, so, uh, you know, when, all, when, the, when the, project, the project is complete, nobody will know that there's actually antennas there, so. And are you, will you be putting installation of uh, facilities on two corners of that building, or just one? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, th there's there's three sectors as we call it. So, um, and I don't know if you have the drawing, but yes. Yeah, so, so we have three sectors of antennas, uh, which is very typical for a wireless site. Uh, but all three sectors will be concealed behind um, our friendly material. Mr. Chairman, any questions? No. The only statement I'd like to make is that this is. A ideal appropriate use where we know that there's going to be an increase in cell towers needed in order to supply the community with the type of service he wants and on commercial property that's not adjacent to residential it's ideally using property that's appropriate and I welcome you wholeheartedly and I echo his feelings exactly it's <clears throat> this may be a great model for uh, for cell tower installation in the future since we all rely on it more and more every day, it's, it's nice to see that we can hide it. So thank you to T-Mobile for, for doing that. Um, this is a public item, isn't it? Thank you for your time. Yes, sir, it is. Um, we'll open it up to the public at the moment. Uh, so anybody, members of the public, have a comment or a question, please step forward. Uh, Sylvan Riggler, 1670 Kelly. I just want to know how, what is the total height of this? The height will be the same height that is the rooftop of the room store now. So the existing parapet and rooftop is not getting any higher. They're concealing the antenna, antenna uh, units behind the parapet. So the height of the building that you see there today will be the same height of the building tomorrow after it's installed. And what are the arrangements if the room store is not a part of it? If they sell or go bust or whatever? <laughs> Sir? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, so T-Mobile has uh, is uh, executing a lease agreement with the room store ownership. So if um, 
you know, it, it would run with the property pretty much. So um, as long as the, um, if there's a future owner, if they still want to continue having the T-Mobile site there, that would be uh, entirely up to them. But obviously it generates revenue, so there's a good chance that whoever owns the building now, I mean, the current ownership or future ownership, they probably would, you know, want to keep the site, obviously, because it generates revenue, so. Thank you. Could I just ask a quick question? Yeah, um, the antenna sits on the roof, is that right? Correct, yeah, the antenna. How high is the parapet, like four feet, or how high is oh. the parapet? About that four feet, but we won't increase any, uh, we won't add any, add any additional height to that parapet, so. Thank you. And, and Frank, you. Uh, to maybe, <clears throat> not to put words in your mouth, ma'am, but to follow up on the lady's thought, uh, what happens uh, when we allow a special use permit or grant a special, well, the council, and please keep in mind today, folks, that the Planning and Zoning Commission is just a recommending body. We don't make rulings on anything. We recommend to council um, what we think is good for the community. So I'm probably preempting the next item, but um, in reference to that, can, the, can that tower ever be uh, seen? If, say, somebody wants to take that parapet wall down, does that, does that nullify the special use permit? Is the concealment part of a special use permit? It's not part of a blanket special use permit, but it certainly could be a condition of approval or recommendation of approval if you'd like. This special use permit application is very specific, the way they filled it out and the way the staff report was written, to maintain the concealment, maintain the stealth technology of the rooftop antenna. So. If you want, I believe that covers it, but however, if you wish to make it a, add a, a, a condition to your motion to say that it conditioned upon the antenna always remaining in stealth, tech, with stealth technology behind the parapet, you can certainly do that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Oh, I'm sorry. There. <laughs> I, would, I haven't address, heard. Please. Yeah, my name is John Vero. I live in the... Uh, in Prescott, Arizona. Do we have, uh, can we have your street address, sir? Excuse me? Your street address? 1155 West Fawn Lane. What I haven't heard is how tall is the entire antenna? I've heard that it's mounted on the roof and the parapet, it's behind the parapet, but if the parapet's four feet high and the antenna's 20 feet high. That isn't the case. Well, I, that's what I'm asking. I haven't heard what the height, total height of the antenna. It seems like that would be important. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, so the antenna will not exceed the height of the existing parapet, so we're not proposing to add any additional height. So in other words, if that parapet it wall, and it looks like it was in the, in the drawings we saw, about three and a half, four foot tall, then the antenna will be less than that? Correct. And just to, to address your um, previous concern about, you know, the stilting, you know, the reality is, is that this uh, this is a valuable property. The room store building is a really valuable property from a commercial standpoint, and you know the revenue that this site will generate, you know the T-Mobile site will generate is is really not that, um, not not really a factor here. So, in other words, you know this this building owner is going to want to maintain the aesthetics of the building. So keeping these antennas concealed is obviously going to be a, you know, very important for the building owner now and in the future that. You know th that the antennas are totally concealed and that the site is not visible because, you know, this is not their primary business. You know, the antennas are, they will generate revenue, but very, very nominal compared to the actual value of the building. So, Mr. Marshall, you have, or, uh, Mr. Matter, you have Can, a question? Uh, let me try to give you an indication what a parapet wall is. Uh, when you build commercial buildings and they have flat roofs, parapet walls are necessary in order to shield the view from below of all of the air conditioning units and all the other special equipment that goes on the roof of a building. So those parapet walls are built, basically they're not part of the structure as far as holding up the building, but as for aesthetic purposes of shielding the air conditioning units, the evap coolers, the fans, whatever other motors or instruments they got running their operation from the public view, so that from the parking lot or adjacent to it, you cannot see all of that equipment on the roof. And this is a, another piece of equipment that's being placed on the roof that's going to be shielded by, quote, what this parapet wall is. Thank you. Mr. Marshall? Uh, Frank, 
Thank you. Just for further explanation, I assume the parapet was part of the original building requirement, and it will stay there as long as the building stays there. That's correct, sir. Okay. Could I just ask a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, of the gentleman from uh, T-Mobile, uh, is there is there any detriment? Can you use the microphone. Sure. Yeah. Uh, is there any detriment to um, making it part of the uh, recommendation that it that it continue to be concealed? I mean, there's doesn't matter to you, does it? No, Mr. Would Chairman, Commissioner. No, it's 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 going to be concealed regardless because, like I said, the the building owner is going to want these antennas to not be visible. So. It really doesn't impact the, the well, project. In order all. to answer the chairman's commitment, as a builder, uh, it's part of the codes that when you build flat roof buildings, you've got to have a parapet wall to shield the equipment on the roof. So, so we don't need to make that a condition. Thanks. Thank you. Ma'am? My name's Linda Amendola. I'm at 1200 Fawn Lane. And uh, my concern is the EMF, the amount of electromagnetic radiation will be uh, emitted from the site, if that could be explained. Uh, I guess there's a couple, <laughs> couple things. <laughs> if I may just Please. give a, a, <laughs> a brief history on, on this. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 is very specific. It doesn't allow this commission or the city council to consider uh, the, the EFF frequencies in determinations on land use issues regarding the placement of cellular arrays or cell towers. It, it is that simple. Um, if, if the T-Mobile rep knows the answer, he's more than welcome to provide it. But again, this commission isn't going to consider it in its determination of making a recommendation to the council, and the council isn't gonna, is not going to consider it as a matter of law either. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, yes, um, obviously that's a very <laughs> common question, and, um, and you know, the FCC is in charge of regulating uh, uh, cellular companies, you know, T-Mobile is licensed by the FCC, but a typical site like this will emit about 1% of what the FCC allows. And this kind of technology, you know, so for this particular site, you probably have more EME from a Wi-Fi system in your home than you would have from this particular site. That's the reality, and that's, that's, that's what we're talking about, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's always a touchy issue, and cell towers is the topic, but uh, we are restricted to having any conversations about the what it emits. Ma'am. Yes, my name is Nancy Weimer. I live at 1162 West Fowler Road. And I'm going to go back to the uh, kind of question issue about the equipment on the roof. Um, I'd just like to recommend that maybe there be some language in the lease between T-Mobile and the owner of the building that whatever is decided about the equipment that it run with the uh, new owner of the building or whoever you know is there so that protects the future okay thank you very much mm -hmm. any other questions or comments we'll close the uh, public session here um, I understand well what the issue is here if I don't know if the commissioners have any other questions. Are there any other questions of the commissioners? Um, in light of the couple of comments that were made, I'd sure like to see that if we uh, if we approve this, that we put the words continually and completely in the motion, uh, just to satisfy the public that that antenna will never be seen. That's just my thought. But do we have a motion? I'll make a motion with your <clears throat> with your change to it that. We recommend approval of SUP 15002, uh, along with a clause stating that uh, uh, in perpetuity uh, the antennas will be hidden from view by the, re the uh, parapet wall and not modified or changed. You mean uh, as long as the, for the leasehold, not well, in perpetuity? You know, as an attorney, you know, and, and as a developer, builder, I know. When you attach something to a building, it becomes permanent. And right. when you sell a building, uh, the owner can't come in and take things off the wall and go away with anything that's screwed to the wall around the building. Or can't sell a building and take the air conditioning units off 
and say, well, they weren't part of the deal. It's everything attached to the building becomes so part fixture. of it. Okay. So this is just added language that really... Uh, so it's sort of, it, it, it's, uh, as you say, it's not really needed, but it's, uh, I think, makes some people feel more comfortable. That's exactly right. Yes. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved unanimously. Thank you. Well, I think that does it for today. <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> try. <laughs> okay. Um, our next agenda item, obviously, is going to have a few more comments than the last two. Uh, we understand that. Uh, I want to make a couple points here before we get into this matter. One, the Commission's not going to allow a lot of conversation about water. It's not under our purview to decide what the water issues are. There are certainly uh, water's a factor in this, but it's not the Planning and Zoning Commission's uh, in its realm to discuss the water at, at all. Uh, the adequacy or the sufficiency or the legal right to it uh, that's a that's a council matter, and we're not we're not able to make a decision based on water. So if I know you guys are going to have a hard time with that in some cases, uh, we're going to ask that we also not repeat what the prior people have said uh, in reference to this issue. Otherwise, we could have 50 people saying the same thing, and we're not going to we're not going to deal with that. So just be tolerant of that, and respectful, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the other thing is, I uh, want you to know. Um, we got it. <laughs> we got your petition. This is a packet, I don't know, of a, of a lot of petitions uh, in reference to the planning and zoning meeting of this morning on this, on this uh, annexation. Uh, obviously, we, we've not had any opportunity to look at these here, but I think in looking through them briefly, I see the same, uh, some of the same uh, comments repeated on, on many of them. So I think the point is is made and likely will be made very early in our discussions here today. So with that in mind, I'd like to make sure that we have a, a organized meeting and, a, and some decorum here and, and not a lot of shouting and clapping, if you don't mind. Uh, with that, George, I see we have an annexation issue today. Would you like to lead our discussion? And you know, I might want to comment that uh, at the hearing last two weeks ago, we had, I think, eight or nine or maybe ten people uh, get up and speak uh, to this issue. And uh, I know that I paid attention to them and so did staff. Uh, uh, they are going to address most of the issues that were brought up two weeks ago. So uh, rest easy on that. Thank you, George. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, because we have a few more folks here this time than last time, I'm going to run back through the the overall annexation process. I'm going to talk about all of it together, but I'm pretty sure most of the folks here are interested in the annexation 002 at the bottom of the screen down here. This is <coughs> Pinion Oaks and this is Williamson Valley Estates and Longview Estates. So this will probably be our primary focus today, but I do want to touch on this one as part of the public hearing process that is required uh, for annexations and for Prop 400 annexations. <coughs> The, there were two issues particular to this, the Southern annexation that I'm going to spend a little extra time on, but I'm going to run through the, the larger one first. So the larger annex, annexation proposal is um, Annex 15001. It is a proposal to annex 1,304 acres into the city. That annexation would include um, an associated rezoning from the uh, city equivalent of county zoning to uh, something very similar to what you see up here. The red areas are commercial, the crosshatched areas are either industrial or mixed use, and then the yellow areas, light and dark yellow areas, are residential. Um, again, corresponding to the city's general plan, land use map, and corresponding to a master plan for this area that was adopted, um, accepted, and approved by the city council in 2009. The 
particular rezonings, I can talk about them if you have specific questions. Uh, the staff report did list the acreages for each of the various zoning districts as they're proposed. Um, I won't go into that level of detail unless you want me to. Uh, at this point, I believe it's probably not that um, uh, high a priority. Uh, I will point out that as part of the annexation process, there are three steps associated with this annexation. Uh, a recommendation from this body regarding annexing the property in and establishing the city zoning that corresponds to the existing county <coughs> zoning. And that's spelled out in your staff report again and one of your motions um, identifies that. The second is the rezoning of the property, which would bring it into conformance with the city's general plan and that master plan I mentioned a moment ago. And the final step would be an amendment to that master plan because the initial master plan did not include this upper corner of the property. And I have the master plan that I can put up if you like, but it basically followed a wash through there and left that piece out. Um, talking about this piece here? That's correct. So it makes sense, and based on an amendment that was made to the city's general plan prior to it being uh, sent to the voters for ratification, and we mentioned that last time around, the general plan was ratified, 80% approximately of the voters of the city approved it. Um, the master plan doesn't now conform to that land use as it was adopted in the general plan and needs to be amended to include that corner for residential purposes. It basically left it in a holding ranching designation um, because in 2009 that's what it was. Uh, since that's changed, that is part of your um, actions today if you choose to do so. Um, you're amending the um, master plan, you're amending the zoning, you're recommending approval of the annexation and establishment of the initial zoning with that annexation. And I just said those in reverse order of what we would like you to do. Your motions in the staff report follow the proper order. Thank you. I think what we're going to do here today uh, on, on these two matters is, uh, uh, and, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Can we we can discuss these jointly? These these four these was it four matters, five matters? You you can discuss them jointly. I think once it comes to the point of making a recommendation to the council, if you're inclined to do that today, we'll consider them individually by motion. But certainly we can we can take them all for the all. sake of discussion. We're right. going to talk about them all. Absolutely. Um, George, at the last at the last meeting, um, much of the discussion was on the 300 acre portion to the west. That's and, correct, sir. And I know a lot of the members of the uh, the public, and presumably many who live uh, in the county nearby. Uh, talked about road connectivity and water. Uh, could could you address any of the comments that they, they made two weeks Certainly. ago? Certainly. Um, if you'll indulge me just a moment, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of this one as well, and we'll go right into that. Uh, the area in question is identified as ANX 15002 on this map. Um, it is um, shown this way in the city's general plan. Uh, this is an indication of the boundary of the area proposed for, for that second annexation. Uh, the yellow is single family zoning um, or an equivalent single family zoning under the city's zoning categories. The sort of brownish color or mustard color uh, would allow for multifamily or single family uh, under the city's general plan. Uh, that designation has been in place for a while and was in fact part of that master plan that I mentioned earlier. Um, the intention of annexation um, is to bring property into the city for various planning and development purposes. So there are some steps in that process that are not necessarily undertaken at the time of annexation. We don't have a development plan. We don't know what street layout or street connectivity would be. And we don't know what type of development would be proposed at this time. That's almost always, almost 99.9% uh, .9 of the times brought to the city by a developer proposing to develop. So until that developer shows up and says, I want to build this on this property, we really don't know what kind of criteria we need to apply based on our zoning codes to his particular development. It's very development specific. 
uh, density comes into play, the connect street connectivity, uh, land uses, the amount of open space that's required all come into play during that process. It's typically done through a subdivision plat. And that's, that's for residential purposes, that's almost always the way it happens. So as a subdivision plat would come forward, we would look at street connectivity and access points. However, we do know some things in advance. Zoom this out just slightly so we get the whole map in here. So Pioneer Parkway is shown here. This is the area proposed for annexation. Pinion Oaks, Williamson Valley Estates, and Longview Subdivision, just for reference. The development and construction of Pioneer Parkway included two potential future street stubs, um, places to allow for a street to continue. It was designed into the, the road um, at the time the, the right-of-way was acquired to allow for these future street connectivity as they're needed. The two points are actually uh, indicated on here with circles and an arrow. Uh, Commerce Drive intersects now with Pioneer Parkway, and there is a widening on the opposite side of the right-of-way for the purpose of an extension of a roadway at some point in the future. And then far down here on the west end, um, adjacent to the state trust lands south of Longview, is another much smaller um, closer to a residential street sized uh, right of way enlargement uh, stub for a potential future street. If you look at the arrows and you consider that typical street intersections are going to be 90 degrees, and even if you consider roundabouts, ultimately the street comes off of the roundabout in 90 degree angles, uh, it's pretty obvious that only one of them is sized and shaped and located to provide reasonable access to the annexation, and that's this one. The one south of Pinion Oaks, it crosses the least amount of Pioneer Park, it would require the least amount of construction to get it all through the park and into uh, private property for future development. And it also provides several potential connections and traffic patterns that are beneficial in the long run. This would allow for, um, and, and I will point out a couple of streets here, and I, I apologize, the map is just not scaled to let you see this very well. There's a street connection here that stubs to the bottom end of Pinion Oaks subdivision um, and, and abuts a piece of, of Pioneer Park. That street stub could potentially be connected to an extension of a roadway here, providing another access out of Pinion Oaks. Right now, the portion of Pinion Oaks subdivision that adjoins the annexation has exactly one road in and out. Um, it, it is not an ideal situation. It was, however, planned um, and designed uh, with these two street stubs. There's one here, and there's one just off of my map to the top up here that allows for future residential road connections. That's the same thing that you see inside of Pinion Oaks now those sized streets, streets that are designed to handle the type of traffic that you have inside of a neighborhood, not passing through a neighborhood. This street connection, or this option for a street connection, would allow something nearly as large as Pioneer Parkway, although we really don't expect a street quite that size, would allow a four-lane road to be extended to the annexation area. We would require, uh, per the master plan, per the city's general plan, that that roadway, as development occurs, be extended through this annexation area to abut the property to the north, which potentially could either develop in the county or develop through an annexation in the city, and ultimately provide a much larger and longer connection, uh, street connection, further north. So the general plan's street circulation map is a very rough layout of where potential streets could go. Um, this one in particular was very rough. The, the dotted line here actually connects to that location on Pioneer Parkway that was designed to allow for a street connection. The original line was just um, roughly sketched in and missed it by uh, about an eighth of a mile. Um, the, the intent of these streets would provide future connectivity and future access for development of properties to the north. Some in the annexation uh, 001 that I talked about first, 
Those would be areas along here. And some into the state land piece, which is this large parcel, parcel right here. Um, the state land department did a land planning um, exercise uh, about 11 or 12 years ago. Um, they came up with uh, proposed land uses for all of the state lands that they had access to, and they provided that information to the city. In 2009, when the master plan for this area was developed, those state land considerations were inserted into that master plan. In fact, the state land department had a person here who participated in that review process and accepted those street layouts. This benefits them because it provides uh, potential commercial property for them at a four-way street intersection at some point in the future. Um, and one other point, uh, state land department's purpose and the purpose of state trust lands is to be sold or leased for development um, to raise money for the state's school system. So we treat state land department land as if it belonged to a private developer for all of our planning purposes because they will sell to a private developer. Anything that's identified as state land anywhere, state trust lands anywhere in the state of Arizona is developable land. It's not open space. Um, I point that out particularly because these cross streets are right in the middle of a very large piece of property that's labeled state land on almost every map. It's state trust lands. It is intended by the state of Arizona for future development. The connectivity issue is, was a big one last time around because there was a lot of concern about this annexation area having its primary access when development occurs through the adjacent subdivisions, Williamson Valley Estates or Pinion Oaks. While connectivity is very important, size and design of such streets are also very important. Neither connection, east or west, into this property are sufficiently sized, nor are they laid out to allow for primary access. They are necessary and appropriate for secondary residential street access into this property. Now obviously the city is not going to make a developer connect to the county over here although county planning would probably support such a connection if it were a residential street connection. Again, we're not talking about a four-lane road. We're not talking about an arterial type of road. This would be an arterial type of road. It would be a larger road, and it would bypass the existing subdivisions, and it would be designed through any proposed new subdivisions to account for the higher, heavier traffic flows that would occur on such a road just like Pioneer Parkway was when it was designed um, and it passes through the subdivision. There are um, additional rights of way to allow buffer space. There are walls on the outside edge of the rights of way to provide sound buffering to adjacent properties. Uh, we would anticipate something like that could well occur at some point in the future. I want to reiterate again, we do not have anyone uh, proposing a development in the annexation areas, either this one or the larger one, at this point in time. However, once it's annexed into the city and once city utilities become available and some of that comes available as a result of being in the city, we don't extend water uh, and sewer services outside the city limits any longer by council policy. So if you're inside via annexation, you have a potential for connecting the city systems. If you're outside, you don't have that potential. So one of the things that we anticipate is once it's annexed in, there may be interest of developers and they may come to us in future years with proposals for development on some of these annexation areas, the 1,500, 1,600 uh, uh, acres of annexation areas. One of the things we also anticipate is because of this is the current alignment of Willow Creek Road. This strange jog here is actually a realignment of Willow Creek Road that's already designed. Um, construction will start. It was done jointly with the county. Um, their engineering services and our engineering services designed this roadway to bypass the current connection and to loop up and connect to the new Ruger Road roundabout. So if you've driven north on State Route 89, that roundabout at north of the airport entrance um, seemingly has a stub leg to the west that doesn't go anywhere, it will connect to Willow Creek Road. Um, this current alignment would be abandoned, not used as uh, a portion of Willow Creek Road. 
Uh, one of the reasons for that is to provide for better connectivity and to avoid the volume of traffic that we currently have running right past this entrance of, of the, um, that's correct, entrance into the airport would provide a safer, uh, higher volume design for roadway than we have currently in place. So you can anticipate that, that occurring. The area around that, as we showed on on the previous map, the area in question, that roadway comes through here and would connect to that roundabout somewhere in here, is primarily commercial in nature. Uh, the proposed zoning, based on the city's general plan and based on the original master plan from 2009, would have primary commercial development along that roadway. Uh, very appropriate for four-lane divided uh, roadway, which it will eventually be. So we, we would anticipate seeing commercial development probably occur first, which is sort of backwards for development uh, patterns. Uh, typically, residential happens and then commercial follows. Uh, but in this case, because the roadway will be constructed um, starting in the very near future, we would anticipate access to those commercial areas would, would make for um, um, an inviting um, situation for commercial developers to, to uh, build along there. Now, that doesn't directly affect uh, this area in any way. The future, future connectivity that we've shown here will take years, if not decades, to ultimately occur. Major arterials are often built by the city. Primarily, those connections are made a piece at a time, paid for by developers. Uh, they're the ones benefiting from it. Why should uh, the other citizens of town pay for it? So typically, the developers would be responsible. When someone comes to us to develop this property, um, because water, sewer, and street connectivity all seem to occur over here, we would anticipate that they would have to acquire right-of-way, design a roadway, and present all of that engineering to us at the same time they do a subdivision plat or propose a subdivision plat to the city for development of this portion or this corner. Um, there is no other logical way to get into that area, and we certainly would not support uh, primary access into the annexation area through an existing subdivision. Again, secondary is appropriate primary access is not appropriate. It would violate our general plan and it would violate our land development code, zoning code. So one other issue that came up before and there was some discussion about it relating to availability of water for this development. Um, Commissioner Scamardo pointed out at that meeting that um, in 1967, the city entered into an agreement with Deepwell Ranches for uh, easements for our transmission lines from our well fields in Chino Valley through this area into Prescott to provide physical water, um, pipelines and water to be pumped through. As a result of that, there was an agreement to provide water to Deepwell Ranches for its future development. The amount of water wasn't determined at that time. It was left for future negotiation. That future negotiation from 1967 actually occurred in 2009 uh, with an agreement with Deepwell Ranches to allocate, excuse me, to reserve an amount of water for development within their property boundaries um, sufficient to cover the proposed development based on the city's general plan and the land use plan, the master plan, which um, is also before you today. That land use plan laid out certain areas for low to medium density residential, other areas for commercial development. Those things were all planned for at the time the water allocation and reservation were made. When development occurs, an allocation will occur from the city. So the city has set aside an amount of water sufficient for the development of these properties, negotiated with the property owner. And that water is set aside for when they need it. Water is allocated at the time that a commercial project that needs water comes to the city for an approval or attempts to connect onto the city's utility system or when a subdivision plat for residential property comes to the city for an approval. Those are required steps to actually get the water into a formal water service agreement, which is the final contract for water. So there is a, a large amount of water that the city has set aside 
that's not used for development anywhere else and cannot be used for development anywhere else except within the deep well ranch, ranches area. Yes, sir, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I believe that that's a contract that the city has to deliver that water whether we annex it into the city or not. That is, is that correct. correct. That is correct. So a development in the county <clears throat> would still have that same allocation of water. The, the amount of water that was allocated to Deepwell Ranches is a direct result of their granting the easements and allowing for the construction of our water pipelines that come from our Chino well fields to Prescott. It has nothing to do with whether they're inside or outside of the city limits. Other development concerns and pressures would favor them being inside the city for a number of reasons. Um, access to other utilities. Uh, again, we, we have to give you the water, but you still have to get to our water and sewer systems. Uh, being inside the city allows for that in an easier process, especially for residential development, than having to go through a potential process of an extension of water mains from county into the city in order to do that. Um, that that's problematic and it requires two um, governmental entities be involved in the review and approval process as opposed to an annexation, meaning just the city of Prescott is the governmental agency doing the review and approval process for those utilities. So there's a benefit to the property owner for the annexation in that he only has to deal with one government for his utility and street connections. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, George, I'd like to clarify one thing of your statement, and, and that is, again, with this agreement that was done years ago, uh, there's a provision in it that states that 950 acre feet of water uh, was set aside, not contingent upon the big Chino project. That's correct. Very important words that was in this agreement that was done years ago, that it was not relying on importing water from the Big Chino in order to supply them, but it was from the existing source of the wells that we currently have in, in Chino Valley. That, that's correct. That water is set aside from the city's current portfolio. Now, this is, there are two types of water in Arizona. <laughs> There's water you can drink physical water, and there's legal water. The legal right to the water is the, the agreement, the water allocation process, the water service agreement. The actual connection to the city's utility <laughs> system is a second aspect of it. Obviously, utility lines have to be large enough to allow for the volume of water you need for residential or commercial development. In many cases, lines are not large enough to supply such a development. The developer is almost exclusively required to enlarge those lines so that he has sufficient water, so that he has sufficient volume of water or sufficient volume to carry the sewer. One of the potential benefits of development for the city's utility system is that as each new phase of development occurs, opportunities are there for looping and interconnecting of water systems. The, the last thing you ever want is a long extension of a water line that just stops. They need to connect back together. It needs to be a circulatory system like our blood system in the human body. It's got to flow around. That's how you maintain pressure and it's how you maintain the amount of water that can flow through pipes. You need the interconnectivity. That occurs as development occurs. So the, the, one of the folks who spoke to you last meeting mentioned water pressure concerns in Pinion Oaks. Um, and, and whether or not such a development would reduce that, that potential. Um, we in fact see an e equal opportunity to increase <clears throat> the water pressure through looping of water systems to provide better water flow and better uh, pressure in those systems. Uh, very common engineering practice, if you talk to any engineer anywhere, he's gonna tell you to loop your systems wherever you can. Thank you. So I think the two biggest points of question last time around uh, from the folks who spoke to us then was the potential street connectivity, which, which I showed on this map, and the issue of whether or not and how much water was available for development of these properties. Um, a, as you are well aware, you're not gonna make a recommendation relating to or involving water. But since it was such a, a common question last time around, I wanted to make sure we mentioned it. That is a, 
a determination that is reserved to the City Council and they will make that determination once you've recommended this forward to them for action. As you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, earlier, this body's purpose is to review and consider all of the related aspects and to make a recommendation to the City Council. Uh, you're recommending only. City Council will ultimately make a determination, yes or no, at a, another public hearing. Um, we will send notifications out again to everyone uh, about uh, future public hearings. Um, and that actually brings up one other topic which I didn't address yet. This is Longview subdivision. This red area is an open space area in Longview subdivision and it is close enough to this portion of the annexation area that it should have had a letter go to the Longview Homeowners Association advising them of this meeting. Now we posted properties with maps and we obviously posted it on the city's website with every, every bit of information that you've received from, from staff. And we also spoke to the press and had a, an article published in the newspaper and it, it did attract attention from the folks in that subdivision but they should have had a formal notice and that was an error on my part. So that's been corrected all future notices will go to the Homeowners Association uh, for distribution to the property owners and Longview uh, subdivision as well. So I just wanted to point that out because I know a number of folks are here from Longview and they know about it. Obviously our outreach um, works. Uh, it just didn't work the way it was supposed to initially. Um, one of the things that we try to do, uh, an important thing for us uh, to do is to use all of the available means of publication. The state of Arizona says that you have to notify, and it lists several different ways to do it. They're each standalone. You could do just one of them. You could post the property, you can publish in the newspaper, or you could mail to no nearby property owners. Well, in fact, what we're doing, what we're doing is all of those and we do all of those for every project that we bring to a public hearing apparently I do not have the right button thank pressed. you <laughs> that's it helps <laughs> with the craning of the neck <laughs> well since we didn't have that on the um, overhead projector would you like me to start over <laughs> no, we're, <laughs> we're, we're fine with that hey George I do have uh, thank you very much that was very detailed uh, no problem I will certainly be happy to take some questions but I do know that the counties um, we have two members of the board um, board of supervisors here who may want to talk to you so uh, if if you would um, like to hold your questions, allow them to make a statement, and then perhaps uh, we can step back up and answer any of your questions. Would That'd that work fine. for you? We can do that. Very good. Good morning, commissioners, chairman. How are you? Mayor, how are you? Good to see you all as always. Uh, I'm Craig Brown, chairman of the Board of Supervisors and for District 4 supervisor which encompasses this area of discussion of annexation. Uh, I think many of the people that we've t we see out here today, a lot of the uh, questions that they have out there, I think George has answered very well. And I, I congratulate you, George, for Thank doing you. such a great presentation. The county's uh, vision in this is not to try and stop any annexation. We're not, that's not what we're here for. Our concern is transportation and the routes in and out of our county areas. So our big concern is obviously where Commerce Drive comes across at Pres you know, Presque Lakes Parkway, I mean at uh, Pioneer Parkway. It moves up towards the Pinion Oaks area, which has been indicated by George already. Our other big concern though is, is over off of uh, Cliff Rose, which is a lot of residents that are still gonna be in the county are concerned that there'll be some, an you know, some activity that takes place to those roads over there. Those are county roads, so we're very concerned about how they're used and the residents over there didn't ever think they were gonna have a big throughway through that area. So we're concerned about that and we appreciate the fact that you've included us in the discussions on what's developed in the future. Now for most of the folks out here, not familiar with this type of process. And again, I'm gonna reiterate what George has already said, is that this is not a short process. This is a long process in the development of this area. We'll be very concerned when we see what happens as far as a PAD recommendation to the city, 
when after you've indexed this area in, and I'm assuming you're going to. So we'll have a lot of input at that point in time, especially concerning the western portion over at Williamson Valley Estates. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one other thing that um, ties into the, uh, the supervisor's comments, and I, I mentioned it last time, I may have mentioned it this morning um, peripherally, we anticipate the shortest and closest connection to utilities to occur at the southwest corner of the proposed annexation area. So we anticipate development to work its way westward uh, over time uh, with development occurring closest to Pinion Oaks first and ultimately over probably longer than my lifetime uh, eventually uh, with the county side um, on the western end of the annexation. Those types of developments tend to go in layers like an onion. Um, they each build on annexations or developments that occur first. So the first development will occur at the closest point where utilities and road connections can occur rather than somewhere far off in the distance with a long extension of a roadway. A very expensive long extension of a roadway would be the responsibility of a developer. So I would anticipate seeing that occur um, many years down the road before development gets cl close to Williamson Valley Estates. George, so I have a question. Could you put this general plan? Plan back up, yes. Thank you. One item that's jumping out at me, and I, and I don't, know we, don't know that we've uh, spoken about it yet today, and that is this looks like a roadway here. And then that was what what is that it was in fact um, a right of way that originally extended all the way to Willow Creek Road um, it would have been called College Park Road it was intended to provide an east-west connection that became superfluous I guess or unnecessary when Pioneer Parkway was designed um, as a result of the Bureau of Land Management's approval of the right-of-way acquisition for Pioneer Parkway, that right-of-way, which would have been the major east-west connector in this area, was abandoned back to BLM. So while it still shows as a separate parcel on here, it's all part of the BLM property that makes up this portion of Pioneer Parkway. And it was part of its purpose of design to give connectivity to that that subdivision in the county there it was designed to provide an east-west connection between Williamson Valley Road and Willow Creek Road it certainly would have passed through the middle right. of Williamson Valley estates had it ever been developed but uh, there's, there's, there's no that does not exist anymore that's correct while it still shows as a separate parcel that parcel belongs to BLM and is part of Pioneer Park thank you Commissioners, you got any comments, thoughts before we turn it over to the to the public? I will open the public meeting. Uh, please, let me remind you, we're going to be limiting the conversation about water. Uh, I know that's a big plea. Uh, we also want you to make sure that we try not to repeat ourselves. I sound like a kindergarten teacher. I'm going to we're going to ask you that we do not repeat ourselves. And when you take the podium, just state your name and address uh, as quickly as you can. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Weimer. I'm at 1162 West Valor. Um, I have some general concerns about this whole thing because I come from California. And I don't want to see this area become another California. I'm tired of houses on top of houses and all of that sort of thing. And. My other specific concern is if people exit out through Williamson Valley, uh, since I'm in Longview, we only have one in and out of there, and it's difficult to get on Williamson Valley Road as it is right now. So if you added the traffic uh, congestion there, it's going to be impossible. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Richard Amadola. I live at 1200 Fawn Lane in Lakeview Estates. And my question is, in uh, 002 there, you have uh, most of it's yellow, and you have that one area that's uh, shaded uh, light brown, yes. You said that's set aside for multiple use, uh, multiple uh, family homes or um, multiple units like apartments? 
That's correct. Its intention would be to allow for single family homes, duplexes, apartment complexes, condominium complexes. So it would allow single or multifamily development. And my question is, is that a requirement that you have multiple uh, family units in, uh, like that uh, in, in that parcel? Uh, in other words, uh, the, intense, the, the <coughs> density of occupation in that area would be increased uh, much if you have a lot of apartments in there. So my question is, do you have to have the apartments in there? Is that part of uh, uh, the, the, a requirement by some kind of rule that says you have to have uh, those kind of the units? Short answer in there? is no. Yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Name is John Vero, eleven fifty-five West Fawn Lane. Um, in the area you're proposing annexation and with multiple family in addition to single lots, how, how large are the lots supposed to be? The, the zoning that we're proposing is based on the adjacent city zoning and it's a minimum of 18,000 square feet per lot, a half acre. A half acre, that's approximately what, okay. What I'm, what I'm getting at, the, most people don't know, the real reason Pioneer Parkway is there is to allow deep well ranch development, as I understand it, on the opposite side of there. There were not enough access for fire routes, and so by the county agreeing to this, um, all of a sudden you added the end of, of the um, Pinion Oaks was developed, and then the section on the other side of the road was developed, which could not have happened because there was no fire access or not enough. What I'm getting to is uh, what is the minimum number of, of um, dwellings, whether it be mobile or, or uh, lots, required uh, for access, fire access? Mm, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, um, typically, <laughs> any kind of development that occurs inside the corporate limits of the city is going to have a requirement for safe fire access in and out. Right. Fire department to get in, access for evacuation of, of, of um, residents out. Um, all of our street design process takes that into consideration. So even residential streets have a minimum of 28 feet of pavement width now in the city of Prescott to allow for fire access and evacuations to occur. So there's no minimum number of residential units that triggers that. We do it for all residential subdivisions. Well, at the time that happened before that wasn't the case. The fire uh, marshal said that they could not develop more until we have access. You had to have at least two access routes. What I'm getting at is your talk proposing one access route, or it looks like, that arrow down at the bottom that's not on, on this attachment um, basically shows that you're heading into space there, state lands, but it looks like the only route is along that line that goes through the back of Longview, and my lot is right on that, that's a wash, right? The, the blue okay. line here, that's the right. wash, yes sir. So it would have to go to the east of that, right? Any, any road that went through there or go through Longview. And the concern we have is Longview has streets that are so narrow they should never have been approved. Because if you park a car on each side, you cannot get a car. You cannot drive through, which is a common problem now when somebody builds a house. Bricks are all over the road, dirt <laughs> piled on the road, trucks for the contractors on both sides of the road. They can't deliver mail, you can't get to your home. Um, well, at the risk to, of uh, to, suffering their wrath, we have two supervisors here for the county, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But the county didn't approve that. The city did. The city did, yeah. Longview was annexed back in the 70s, so um, it's, not a, it's not a recent thing. Wasn't it after it was developed that it was annexed? It may have been the part right on Williamson Valley so Road. Because in the city of Prescott, our requirements for a subdivision before it gets approved, before the first house is built, is that they have to have currently 28-foot streets, curbs, gutters, and sidewalks on one side, curbs on both sides. Uh, where in the county, 
and in the city prior to those zoning changes and code changes that were made, uh, a developer could do a 24-foot road or a 20-foot road or a 16-foot roadway, and the problems that you're bringing out are some of the problems of why in our code mm -hmm. we went to 28-foot streets right. with curbs and gutters and side right. roads. Well, I'm just telling you what it is now. So if you I were know, to suggest I'm ever sure going I've been through, a long time and remember yeah. when that came in also. <laughs> the, the problem is that if you ever go through Longview or some of the other, uh, tried to get another access to Pinion Oaks. If you look at the, those roads, they can't take any more traffic, and it certainly wouldn't be a fire access. But my my. What I'm concerned about is I think that you're going to have to have, from the size of that land mass, you're going to have to have a minimum of two access routes. And now you're getting into some serious considerations as to where they go. And again, I'd like to point out that this is at the stage that they're coming in with a development plan showing the lots and what the use is going to be. And at that time is when we discuss the access to the property and say you're going to need two access ways in the east and the west. They have to be 50-foot streets. <clears throat> They've got to be dual lane or whatever it is mm -hmm. in order to handle and maintain the traffic. Otherwise, we're not going to approve a subdivision. That comes after the annexation. Today, we're talking yeah. about annexation of raw land coming into the city with a general plan that was passed by the voters that said this land should be master plan at some time that it's annexed in part of the city. And we follow the, the general plan, the airport specific plan, and today we're discussing annexation of this land so that the planning right. process could be started. The items that you're bringing up are very valid. They come in the stage when they come in and say, we've got a 300 acre parcel and we want it zoned the following way, and here's our development plan. And at well, that time, <clears throat> we get into all of the other uses that are required in order to approve that section of this 1900 acres. Thank you. Mr. Schmara, the thing that I, which is irritating about this whole thing is we can't talk about water, and yet water is not considered until after the annexation is approved. You know, we again, can't talk I don't, about I don't want to fire get access. Water, but the water for this particular project, the 950 acres, was put aside over 40 years ago. Not 40 years ago. Well, 1967, okay. uh, whatever Thank you, sir. But anyway, Any other questions, yeah. sir? Well, the part of the water was what happened to the law that required you, the city had to declare in 1999 the last 30,000 lots that were going to be approved for the water that was thought to be available. We now know it isn't available because we're all seriously overdrafting. So I think these are, I think putting the cart before the horse never, never gets you <laughs> on a road. Thank you. Thank you. George, I'd like to go back just a step and make sure, because uh, Mr. Scarmato made a great point, and I want to I want to punctuate it. Uh, what we're doing today is discussing an annexation of land into the city that's contiguous or adjacent to our current city borders. And part of the, the requirement as to, because of the size of this annexation, is the Prop, Proposition 400 mandate that required a master plan. And we also have a general plan that most of this, this application here, these applications here in front of us pretty much comply with. Would you clarify that if, if this happens in a couple of months by the city council approving this, could someone come in tomorrow and start building houses on that land without coming back to the city for anything? No. Um, what would they have to do? There would be a number of steps necessary. Um, in most cases, houses are built in a subdivision. There's a subdivision plat process. Starts with a proposal for lot layout, street connectivity, utility lines. It's drawn up. It comes before this body for a review and recommendation, and then it goes to the city council for an approval. As part of a subdivision plat process, there's also the water service agreement I mentioned earlier. That's when water is actually allocated to a development. Right now, there's, it's held. Right. Uh, aside for this. Um, when that process starts, it generally is a very technical review. We look at, you have this many lots, your streets need to be this wide, you need this large or small of water or sewer lines, and that review process goes through planning commission and ultimately to city council for approval. 
Thank you. And, and I want to emphasize that in our discussions today. This is a, an idea as to what should be or what the city feels and what we all feel should be in that area. It's not specific. There's not necessarily going to be a house there tomorrow. They have to get approval. Without annexation, I think somebody could put up houses there tomorrow. Wells and septic systems and individual lots, as long as they meet the county zone, in which is right. approximately two acres per lot. Correct. So I, I just want to emphasize that whatever, m much of the, what we're discussing today has to do with what happens when someone comes in and says, I want to build 100 houses there or 200 houses. Where do the streets go? That's all going to come back through the city again at some other time when the developer of that project wants to submit his plan for what they do for that piece of, of this property. Okay, uh, any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. My name is Eric Slett, and I live at 1075 Longview. And um, I just wanted to take a couple of seconds to point out a few things that have happened recently. Um, within a day of that article appearing in the paper, two homes in escrow fell out of escrow. In both cases, buyers withdrew the offer. So <clears throat> this is already having an impact, and it hasn't even started. What I would like to propose is that you consider not doing annexation until such time as you've reviewed the zoning. The multifamily housing in that area is totally inappropriate. It's seven miles from the nearest other similar unit. It's an area that's rural. And you're also at a transition point between the county and the city. So you can aspire to the lowest standard and say, we'll build on half acre lots, or you can aspire to the higher standard and say, we'll do what's consistent with the other areas around and some of those areas are acre lots. So I would request that you consider just not doing this until you've had a chance to go back and get the zoning appropriate to the area. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chuck Queen, 5983 Symphony Drive, live in Pinion Oaks. And I have a question relative to why the determination came for the multifamily zoning in that area. And it ties into the uh, previous speakers to it does seem inappropriate for the area completely to us. And secondarily, you've already said that it was not a requirement. It was not a mandate. So it's obviously the decision that was reached based on some criteria. And I'd like to know what that criteria was. Thank so there's several things that actually influence that. Um, let me zoom back out and show you the whole thing. This is, this is the master plan that was um, uh, approved by the city and approved by the property owner, um, Deepwell Ranches and the State Land Department back in 2009. Um, that generally lays out where multifamily, single family, commercial and industrial properties would occur uh, for future uh, annexations and rezonings. Uh, one of the things that was done was an area here, this is that strange shape that we see uh, on, on the city's general plan map, uh, was designated as an area where higher density and potentially a school could go. Um, at, at the time, there was consideration, and, and again, keep in mind this was 2009 and 2008 during the discussions, there was, there was a possibility that um, you know, that location might be appropriate for a school. Uh, the city's zoning and the land use designations for that, based on our current general plan and the proposed zoning that matches the general plan, do not in any way require multifamily development. They allow for it. So if someone wants to build multifamily with this zoning, they could. Now, it's also possible to amend the zoning or modify the zoning. Uh, the general plan map, the proposed zoning for the area could be amended. Um, and that's something that, um, that could be done prior to the annexation if the city council chooses to do so. Um, it, at this point in time, we were simply following through on those previous plans, the general plan um, and, and the master plan from 2008-09. Um, that's where those, that designation came from. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. A quick follow-up. <laughs> If you could you the take the mic, sir? Sir, could you take the microphone, please? Please. That way you're on the record. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just a quick Though you have a good voice. <laughs> As you say that uh, you're following the master plan, 
the master plan did not specifically call out an area for high density, which you are currently doing on the latest thing I've seen. So that doesn't sound like you're following it. It says like you're modifying it or adding to it. Actually, the master plan called out a multifamily zoning of some type in that area. This is the master plan from 2008 and 2009, and it did lay out that area, which is, again, uh, we all agree it's in the middle of nowhere right now, kind of an odd location for multifamily, but we're following the master plan that was approved by um, the city, the county, um, the property owner, and the Bureau of Okay, so plans. you did you did look at the area, what was currently in the area, and consider that when you put the multifamily in there. That's correct. It's it's the flattest spot out there. It it would make sense if well, you were I, going I, to develop. I'm sorry, I've been a, I was retired from construction for many reasons, and I can make any spot flat. <laughs> we have, we have a number of folks in town that are specialists. Several of us know that. <laughs> George, could you put up the general plan just for a moment of that area? You can take advantage of very Hi, I'm Dennis Bailey, 1150 Fawn Lane. Hold on one second, sir, if you wouldn't mind. No. Yes, sir. Is that the general plan? This is the general plan's land use map. So the dark yellow color is single family, and that sort of brownish, tannish color is multifamily. So that, that, that section, that multifamily designation in that particular location was there for the general plan and for the master plan? It, it carried from one to the other, yes, okay. sir. They, I just they match. To clarify that, sir. Hi, Dennis, yes, sir. Dennis Bailey, 1150 Fawn Lane. I, I think that uh, everybody's getting the, the development way be ahead of what should be discussed here. I think most people in this room and many people in Prescott moved to this town because they like a town of 50,000 rather than a town of 200,000. I, I think most people don't even want this town to grow. And everybody raise your hand if they agree with that. Do they want <laughs> And I bet if you took a poll of the whole city, it would be 80 plus percent that don't want a larger town. What's wrong with having Prescott be 50,000 instead of 200,000? Um, Good point. Secondly, if we do do this expansion, it's going to take more police, more schools, as you brought up. We don't want a school there. It's going to be more schools. Uh, right now, the police can't enforce the speed limits on Williamson Valley Road and Pioneer Parkway the way it is. Imagine with 10 times that traffic there. And not to mention all the other costs that go along with the development of something like this. More and more firemen are going to have to be hired. Let's keep our taxes down and not keep expanding. Everybody here likes a small town, right? Thank you. Those who were here 40 years ago might have said the same thing, in which case this room would not be filled today. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Scamata. You know, we're looking at two items here, and we're concentrating 100% of our time on one. If you look at the map, what we're talking about, all of this is being considered as part of the annexation. All of this is being part of the, con the uh, consideration, and the parcel that we're not talking about is the major parcel up in here, which is 1,600 acres, and we're concentrating all our conversation down to where the dot is in that little shaded area different where the 300 acres is that's adjacent to uh, Williamson Valley Estates and Pinion Oaks and so forth. So it almost appears like we should break this off and say, what do we want to do here, and then have a separate discussion on this one 300-acre th portion here. Thank but you. all of the conversation today is on this small portion that's next to those subdivisions rather than the overall picture, which came about by the airport specific plan to provide industrial and commercial areas around the airport, protect the airport from having residential go in I agree. and create in fact, a problem. There are, and there we're concentrating <clears throat> on one small part of it rather than the overall... Well, the discussion the so port. far is about that, but we are going to vote on these <coughs> independently. Anyway, I understand. So, yeah. um, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bob White. I'm a resident of uh, Pinion Oaks, right near the very top corner of that area. Uh, I just wanted to address some issues as a property owner and involved in due diligence before I moved into that area. Uh, 2013, I decided to build in Pinion Oaks, and I made a point to spend quite a bit of time with the planning people in the city. I saw the drawings of the potential roads, and I was told, don't worry about it, they won't happen for over 10 years. That's nice, however, 
you may be talking annexation today, but those are still on the plan. So I got one piece of information that gave me a 10-year window, which I'm okay with. Subsequently, after I built my house and have lived there, I had a relative that wanted to move near me on the edge of that corner there, which is Chive Lane, and we did due diligence on that property in May of 2015. Approaching the city, pointing out the parcel, we were showing there's land immediately behind it on that boundary owned by the state of Arizona. Whereupon I inquired, what is the plan for that land? And I was told again, don't worry about it for five or 10 years. So I did a little more investigation and learned that the state of Arizona, from what I found out, basically agrees to transfer whenever they're ready those right-of-ways. And so I walked away from that property. What brings me here today is part of that background as well as another issue. In my initial research in the Pinion Oaks community, and I'm in the north sector, I noticed that when I drove through, there's only one access road in there and one out. I previously lived in a high fire zone area. I made the inquiry before building that property. Why is there only one road? I was told there are three other access points, which I did walk and locate. They're locked and gated. The gentleman from planning today stated, it would be very good for the people of Pinion Oaks to have this annexation with that road as another way out, which begs the question, who initially gave us one road in and out? That seems to me a real contradiction. The other issue I have, if you can go up on the map. So there's 15001, and 15, is that four on the right? It's still one. One. Yeah, so relabeled it. If I were an investor, and I wanted to build out a development, why would I put it at the very south end where you have to drag the infrastructure in? It's not there. Why don't you put it to the left or to the bottom of 15001 on that map? You have infrastructure, you have vacant land, and you have access immediately to your widened Willow Creek. So, so how did it appear down at the very bottom? I'm not sure what you mean. How did zero, what appear? Zero, zero. Are you referring to the parts of the second one, zero, zero, 002? Yeah, two. I'm sorry. I didn't see the number. Right. Yes. So, so how is it that you want to cut roads in, go to all that expense to drag in that 320-something acre parcel rather than just put it up there in 15001 or immediately below it? There's already all the facilities there. Well, one reason this is broken into two separate annexations is that they aren't, they are not contiguous. So the property owner wants to annex two portions of property into the city and proposes two separate annexations, okay. which allows the city planning commission recommendation and council action on either or both. So they would have okay. the ability to just approve one should they choose to do that. Well, I understand that and, and I would advocate for that, but I'm still somewhat confused. So. If this development on 15002 is within the owner's request, why couldn't it be put in 15001? I mean, move it. Development I mean, can occur in 15001. The, the, same, the same type of development can occur in 15001 well, at a much more expensive process of extending the roads residential process of extending the roads westward into that area where they're the, where the there. word no they're, they're already not, there there are you none have Willow in the creek and you're building it four lanes wide but none of those are in the single family zoning area well that, exactly that's my an point. extension of roadway okay and, and i'll get to my last point again a point of some confusion why today what is the rush on now annexing it when i was told in may that there is no plan for any of this so my research that I found, and may have been uh, upended today with a discussion about the agreement between the James Ranch and the city. And the agreement seems to be it's a reciprocal agreement, that the ranch is going to yield up some water and the city is going to give some development rights. Is there a time limit on that agreement? Not, not within our lifetime. So who initiated this annexation that we're here about today? Who started this? <coughs> the property owner. So, so that's who we're dealing with? Yes. Okay. Uh, the city is handling it through that agreement. The city handles the whole process. Okay. Typically, a lot of what I presented today would be presented by a private planner 
in some circumstances. In this circumstance, it was negotiated as part of the master plan that the city would handle all of the steps, but the annexation and determination of what is proposed for, for annexation at each stage along the way is within the control of the property owner. Does the city have a reciprocal agreement with the ranch that they have to honor? Yes. And what is the time fuse on that agreement? There's always some time certain on an agreement. I don't know. So that's open. It, it is very long term and it's related to water and future annexation. So I was told long term before I purchased that property was 10 years. We're here today. Okay, that's two years. Well, I would point out long term is not 10 years. Long term is 50 years. Okay, so, so I, I would point out that, that you should be reluctant about quoting any years because I made an investment decision based on information gathered from mm -hmm. the planning department. And what was your question to the planning department? Will there be development oh, or will absolutely. there be absolutely. I did complete due diligence on that whole ranch property. I found the pipeline. I Understood. asked for meets uh, and sir, bounds of those roads. Sir, we weren't at that all, meeting. We, can't, uh, we understand your point. Uh, your question yeah. is you thought it was going to be something that now you feel it may be something different. Right. And my final point to you is make two annexation proposals. One is ready on commercial land with nobody standing up and having any issue with it. Make that one, make this one too, and put off 15002 until you have a chance to really get people well informed on why we're doing this. That's all I ask. That's an adequate, <laughs> sir. You know, that's a proposal that we can take in because when we get ready to vote, even though we're talking about the four or all of the parcels as one item, when we get ready to vote, we got to vote for them individually to make a recommendation to start the Prop 400, which is the 60-day period and all of the other things that are necessary. And when that particular parcel, 15002, comes up, we may have put contingencies in about uh, holding it up and going at a separate pace or doing whatever we come up. But it's a good point that although we're talking about all of the projects or at all of the acreage today as one item, when we get ready to vote, as we've heard from our attorneys, We've got to vote on them and make a recommendation individually. Thank so you. I appreciate point. it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question what? of. Let's, let's hear from a couple more of the. You want me to go here? I'm well, finished. Well, it concerns his point. Go ahead. It's a question to George. The, yes, sir. Mr. White, I yes. believe, has asked who initiated this process, and I believe you said it was the, the property owner. The uh, property owner a, has ultimate control. a corporate entity. Who is the property owner? James Deepwell Ranch is and are we number two. Hear from a representative of the. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Um, again, part of the agreement that was made in 2009 was for the city to handle the, all of the administrative processes for annexations. So they nod their head. We go through this process to uh, propose the annexations before you. So we're sort of handling a piece of that that normally would be handled by but private developers. What developer. we're here is a lot of concern in the community about what is the real plan here, what's the long-range plan, without hearing from the, the owner, the developer, what. The, the long-range plan is what's shown on the general plan. Residential where it's yellow, red where it's commercial. The problem we have is there's a lot of concern about the impacts of development, and as, as far as we know, no one has brought a development forward. I think we do not have a proposed far, development. I think we're getting a little far stream here. The issue for us to discuss today is whether this land should be under the uh, jurisdiction of the city or the county. Who, who wanted it? Who, who benefits from it is almost irrelevant from, to our discussion. That probably could be discussed in other meetings, but right now we're here to look at is this a good thing for the city to bring more property into its jurisdiction to control that property so we know what's going to be there in the future. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Calvin Rolf Eckel, 1385 West Merrill Drive. I live in uh, Williamson Valley Estates. I think the premise that the development is going to start on the east side and, and work its way to the west is false. The high ground is actually on the west side. That's the best views. That's where they're going to want to put the high dollar homes first. That's going to put a lot of pressure on the west side to get access uh, initially. So my recommendation to this commission is if you do agree to annex this, uh, this piece of property, make it a condition that all ingress and egress comes out through the areas other than the two developments on both sides. That's going to be the de facto road to Williamson Valley. They're going to, even if it's a secondary road, as you're calling them secondary roads, 
Those will become primary roads because it's the shortest distance to Williamson Valley Road. Get you to Chino Valley easily, get you uh, to those access points easily. So if there is some wording you can put into the, the agreement that says all ingress and egress, no secondary roads to our private uh, uh, developed areas, those, those roads are not safe. They're narrow, they have, we've talked about it before, they have hills, undulating hills, they have blind driveways, they're not safe, for, it barely handles the traffic now. So if we can put some sort of condition in there that, that won't have ingress and egress through those two neighborhoods would be my recommendation. And, and am, I, am I correct in assuming that you're talking, well, we don't have the map up, but it's that 300 acre par parcel that we're talking about? Yes, sir. It's and not it's, the it's major 1,600 acres, it's that one 300 acre parcel. W with two established uh, developments you. on both sides, I'm yes, sir. I'm with you all the way. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. I think, uh, I think at the moment. Sorry, three developments, also Longview. Thank you. Sorry, Longview. <laughs> I think at the moment we, uh, we're going to take a little break here. Uh, so we're going to take a little 10 minute break so the commissioners and any of the members of the audience can uh, uh, enjoy themselves. Thank you. <laughs>
Reconvening here. Everybody will settle in a little for a second here. We're gonna we're gonna talk to a couple more speakers. Uh, that's the trouble with our, our room is a tight room, so it's easy to hear voices uh, flying around here. We're gonna talk to a couple more speakers, and then we'll close the public uh, session. And uh, commissioners will discuss uh, everything they've heard and and share with you some of uh, their their thoughts. So. Um, Ma'am, I know you have another commitment you want to get to, so if you wouldn't mind, come on up. And Thank you. It's uh, Sullivan Regular uh, 1670 Kelly, which is in Williamson Valley Estates. Uh, <coughs> and I would like to just go on record as urging you not to approve of the annexation 15002, <laughs> which is the property which is adjacent to mine. or would most impact me, and I think it would be a very negative impact on me as far as taxes, my property values, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Could, could thank I, ma'am, ma you say you, it would negatively impact you, and, and why do you say that? Okay, Why do you think it would, what, raise your taxes, or could you uh, Talking about developing it. Yes. And my property is not going to change. You put in new property there on a third of an acre for most of it, and or have multifamily housing. All right, I take your. These point. people, uh, what's the price going to be of those houses? You're concerned about. They're going to be new construction for the same size construction. I have a forty-year-old house. I understand. Thank, Thank you. I want to. I want to remind everyone that we're not approving a development plan for any particular parcel. We're, we're talking about annexation. And in order to bring property into the city, we have to have a plan for it. And probably the easiest and the safest plan might be, one might argue, single family zoning for a lot of this. So there is no development plan, uh, as the lady had just mentioned. Uh, there are no streets. There are no, there's none of that stuff planned at this point. It's simply a part of a master plan for this area of the community and I think we're I think we're at the point now where we no longer should be talking about where a road's going to be because we don't know where a road's going to be somebody who comes in to develop this will determine that no. so no no that's the point Can you state your name and address please Bob Mall 1050 Longview Drive <clears throat> Prescott Arizona you've already got a situation with uh, Pinion Oaks where you don't have the <coughs> dual access. I saw no plans, none, except one access to ANX 15-002. Where is the plan, which is part of what should be done here on an overall basis, of where that second access is going to come in. My, that's my point. I'm done. Okay, thank you, sir. Ma'am? Hi. Janet Bissell Erickson. I live at 5750 North Bailey Avenue. I live at the intersection of the Cliff Rose Road Extension, Merrill, and Bailey. So, if, and we won't talk about the road, but I am strongly opposed to there being any connection through if there is approval of the Annex 15002. My one main question is, there's a gas line, gas pipeline, that's on the land of 002. Could you show us where that is? I don't have it on a map, but it 
it runs through here. Yeah. And can you show us where the power lines go through? Uh, they're a little bit further east of there. Okay, so what's the proposal and what would be handling the development in that area of that section of this annexation? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, they can't the build over the goes... gas lines and they can't build under the electric lines, so there would be corridors as part of the development plan to allow for those utilities to stay in place. What, yeah, what would be the setbacks? And so if we, I mean, I guess I, my point is it might make people in Williamson Valley Estate and Longview feel a little bit better if we knew what the buffer was going to be. You see what I'm saying? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Just when we talk about water, somebody brings water to the <laughs> And guess who? <laughs> Leslie yes, Hoy, 1880 Coyote Road. Um, I have three questions. The first one is, is the pre-annexation available for the public to review? It's, it's on the city website. Oh. And can you uh, there is a link on the city of Prescott's website for this annexation process. It has all of the attachments and all of the previous agreements on it. They're PDF files that you can read or print out. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, secondly, um, I know that 950 acre feet, this, I'm, this comes to um, the projected population for the area, it's not really a water question. But I know I that 950. going to be masked in that. <laughs> <laughs> 950 acre feet um, have been allocated, as you had explained. There's a second 950 acre feet that's been promised as this annexation should the Big Chino pipeline um, be built. So that's a total of 1,900 acre feet. So what I'd like to know is how what is the projected population for the total area? You said that the water allocation, I think, believe Mr. Worley said the water allocation was based on a population projection. No, it was not as far as I know. Um, my understanding is that negotiation occurred between the property owner and the city relating to the easement. So the, the negotiation wasn't for the potential um, population. And we, we don't know that. We could do a calculation based on what the potential for each of these uh, land use categories is, but it's not going to be accurate because it doesn't take into account um, issues with the terrain that will affect development. Typically, when we say it's single family, 18,000 square foot minimum lot size, with a development, the initial thing you do is take 20% of the area out for streets. So right off the bat, you remove 20%. Then you remove other areas that aren't developable before you ever get to an actual lot count, and then we do the lot count. So it's too early for us to actually consider that. Someone needs to make a proposal to us before we can start counting lots, and you, therefore population. And by the way, the city of Prescott's average household size is two. I thought it was um, 2.5, has it shrunk? Nope, it, it, sh it shrunk. In fact, it's slightly <laughs> okay. under two. Okay, and are we still, thinking 0.35 acre foot per household? That's correct. I don't believe that policy would change. That would require the state um, ADWR uh, concurrence because it's uh, established in the decision and order. Okay, well, we could make some kind of rough calculation, but just for your information, at another meeting and several other meetings, I was told that when the, the agreement was made with the James family in 1967, that they were granted, it was based on a water pipe size it was. And then later, only perhaps in 2009, then they agreed to take less water than they might have gotten otherwise. That's what was said at another meeting. The, the 1967 agreement was a very broad agreement. Right. We would supply water to the ranch if they would let us build it a was, pipeline. It was before the city had to account for water under the alternative yeah. water process. So it was... Um, it was kind of just a gentleman's agreement that we will supply water with no particular amount. That was negotiated in the 2008-2009 okay. uh, master you. plan. Okay, well, We're I not just, going to talk about water. No, I know, but can I just, I have two quick not things. Not if you're going to mention the W word. Okay. <laughs> um, the, my question is, does the city have some idea or some calculation about the proposed population for this area? No, I, I don't know. That we, we don't we, have we a do clue. Not, we do not have a proposed population. That would depend okay. on development. We, we would like to know the person that had that number. 
Okay, well. I can come up with some numbers. It'd be a great number okay. for one to ask. It, it the just, reason we don't have that number is that if you just use conjecture, you're going to come up with a number much larger than reality will ever reach. What is a start? Well, yeah, to reality. me, it seems if you're doing prudent planning, you need to have some idea. I mean, that impacts the whole quality of life, the cost of living here, so many things. And there are other annexations coming after this one, so I hope somebody's thinking about how many people is it. Um, my third thing is, if you pass this annexation today, then it starts the Prop 400 process. The hearings are currently scheduled for, I believe, October 6th and November 10th, or it might be 3rd. They're the very same days at council that the council is considering their um, budget problems. So it just seems to me that's a train wreck coming and someone ought to think about it. Thank you. Thank you. And you, you, you did very well. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name's Karen Fletcher. I live at 2058 West Mountain Oak in Prescott, and I'm very glad to be here. May we please look at attachment three? Is that the street attachment? There you go. Nope, the yellow Several one. Plans. Okay. Can you please show me where the circle trail is? Um, I actually have a separate attachment, I believe, with that. You can just point out approximately where it is. I'll be okay with that, if you know. Hmm. Part of the beauty of this city is our access to the public land, the Circle Trail. This is the type of people that we're looking to come into our community, are people that appreciate that. I'm very concerned about the access to the state land being denied by Annex 15002. I would like to see you put an area in there where we would have access to the state land and also in 15001 I would like to see the same with uh, parking and access. And again to point out that comes with the plat process when the developer comes in and said here's what I want to do with development with roads, streets, curbs, gutters that's the time that the planning commission says well there's a trail nearby we want access to it and he has to provide it in the plat before it's approved. And those steps come when someone comes in with a development plan. Uh, and all of the other lands that have been annexed so far, like Granite Oaks and Granite Dells, and I'm sorry, not Granite Oaks, but um, the Dells, uh, have those access agreements where they're tying into the existing trail systems. And if there's open space, again, they want the open space to have activity where it's not blocked off and say, here's our open space, but it's got some kind of connectivity. Those are things that we review in the plat process when there is an actual subdivision coming in showing the lots, the curbs, the streets, the width, the grading, the drainage plan, and all of the other things that go into development before they can put the first stick of lumber on the site. Thank you very much. I'd like to go on record today as having requested that when that time does come that you please think of me. In addition, I'd like to point out, and we all know good and well, the elephant in the room is the multifamily zoning in 002. That's the elephant in the yeah, room. And, and, and I, we're leaning, or I am, I don't know where the other commissioners are until we get ready to vote, but I'm leaning to separate 15002. Uh, away from the major portion of this, which is the 1,600 acres, and I, we have to vote on them separately. And when we get to the 15002, to say hold off for future discussion with a possible revision on the multifamily. Sir, I think everybody would be very appreciative Thank of you. that. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Jim Sanders. I'm a Pinion Oaks resident, and um, everybody has stated their concerns, and the biggest elephant in the room is not knowing what the plot is going to be, and that you're actually putting the cart before the horse, as somebody else has stated, that if you go ahead and agree to this, you're opening the floodgates to whatever comes next, the planning part of this, which is what you guys should know before you take on this huge tax burden, liability, whatever you want to call it. If you leave it as, uh, if we don't annex it, it's limited to acre lots, which is perfectly conducive to what it's 
there already. And so, once again, I'm just stating my opposition to to deciding this today. Um, and if you do decide it, there needs to be some great revisions to the quote unquote master plan that was done. I don't know how many years ago, which also um, addressed that uh, multifamily home issue. Right. Thank Thanks. you, sir. All right, we'll hear a couple more. Yes, sir. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for putting this out there so everybody knows about it. I work with three different public agencies in my life, and they quite often cause themselves huge problems by not letting the public know, and then they don't know what to do when you got the... Could you give us your name and address? Oh, sorry. Rod Smith, 5695 Bailey, I'm in Williamson Didn't Valley Estates. Anyway, I think it's appropriate that you're doing it the way that you're doing it so everybody has a voice in the process. I see three problems here, or there's three things I want to talk briefly about. I will be brief on them. First off, nobody knows how many houses are going to be going where, how many residents are going to be going where. I see this as having the potential to be like Frontier Day weekend, where the population of the city doubles because of people coming up here to enjoy what Prescott is. Nobody wants to see that. We don't want the smog. We don't want the traffic. Everybody knows that Will Willow Creek Road, or excuse me, yeah, Willow Creek Road is a train wreck at certain hours of the day and has a ton of traffic. There's two roads that I see as being impacted by this a lot outside of Pioneer Parkway. Those two roads would be 89 and Willow Creek Road. We don't need that kind of congestion. I also see four groups as being the ones that are going to benefit from this the most. One is the owners of the Deepwell Ranch. The second is developers. The third is the contractors that are going to be involved in this. And the fourth is the city. Now, I understand there's budget problems. I've worked for th three public agencies, like I said. But basing the budget problems on income on something like this, to me, is putting the cart before the horse and ruining what Prescott's all about and why everybody came here. I uh, think also that we need to not railroad this thing through, and I'd like to request the city council not do that. There's two months, today's the 10th, there's two months before you guys are going to have a meeting and decide on this. There's a lot of things that haven't been talked about. There's a lot of things that haven't been decided. One of the biggest problems to me on this whole thing is <laughs> what's going to happen? Stuff's going to get annexed, and nobody has a plan. And I understand that you're putting that on developers. But as a city council and as residents, the ones that are city residents, I wouldn't because I'm a county resident, but the ones that are, that are city residents need to have a voice in this. This stuff started in 67. It happened in 08. It happened in 09. All of this, but we have two months where this has got to happen. I don't think it's appropriate. And I don't think that it's going to do anything than, than create a big loggerhead and a bunch of bad feelings between the public and the public agencies. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Take two more people. First, I want to thank you for the break you gave us. I'm Joyce Mackin, Williamson Valley Estates. I think you should drop the whole annexation of 15002. There's a lot of controversy. We don't have a, a really a plan, and uh, certainly the annexation that exists right now is not compatible with the surrounding area, which is rural, equestrian, and open space. So I'd appreciate it if you would just drop the annexation of 15002. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to point out that there is no open space there. It is, it is rural. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. That's not considered open space. It's ranch land right now. Yes, ranch land is open space, sir. 
and Pioneer Park is also open space. Thank you. <laughs> Becky. My name is Becky Koschel. I reside at 1400 West Cliff Rose Road off of Williamson Valley, which happens to be one of those roads involved with potentially future changes with 002. My concern is with the street that I reside on is that there's been multiple accidents, there's been fatalities. It's a corner. It currently has an area to where it's hard for us to get out in like Longview is the same area as someone had spoken earlier. There are also two sections of our road that are in a floodplain. My husband goes out with the tractor and takes all of the debris out of the roadway because the county doesn't keep it clean. On the other far east end of Cliff Rose, it basically becomes an, a native road, which goes straight down east and is also another very major, major flood area. Goes down north to Merle and to McIntosh, which most of us know what has happened in the past with the flood area. Yes, this is only a proposal in having the annexation, I understand that. But please take into consideration the people that reside in these neighborhoods. That it is also a very narrow road as it is, barely getting one and a half cars down there. There's little side walls and cliffs going in certain sections. There's a lot of improvements that anyone would have to go through. I was raised in this community. I built my house on that property. I've had the property for over 40 years. And I don't plan on going anywhere, and I don't want to see it destroyed. Thank you. One more. I'm a half person, so maybe another half can come behind me. Uh, my name is Douglas Chang. I live on 1140 West Cliff Rose Road in the Williamson Valley Estates. And I am a kind of a numbers guy. The annexation of both of these two uh, tracts of land and with the zoning there, there will be over 10,000 new homes built on it. And of course, you say we have less than two people live in these homes. I suggest it's probably more four people per home. And that'd be 40,000 people. So 40,000 people is now the population of Prescott itself, the city. So you will be doubling, potentially doubling, with the number of homes that will be allowed to build on this. Um, currently, if you stayed with the county, and you only have, you, I hear eight, one and a half acres to two acres, it's much less people on, the, on that property. And density is what I'm talking about. And quality of life, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for my grandchildren. I have a grandson and a grandchild, I mean granddaughter, emotional, because I want them to appreciate what we have now. And there's a change in the direction, which is high density living. And uh, the property that I, we own, been in the family since 76. I purchased what I bought in 89. And uh, so far, the development has stayed with the uh, things that I want, which is good water, clean air, a small town atmosphere. Everybody came from someplace here. In 75, when I, my first job was with the VA as a, uh, as a graduate from college, 16,000 people lived in Prescott. Prescott Valley did not exist. And Chino was a wide spot in the road. And I'm not saying develop, not develop, develop, but please develop so that my grandchildren, your grandchildren, can have the same wonderful feeling here, which is clean air, clean water, no traffic per se, you know. This annexation is a, is a deviant from what has been happening. So please, you have the power, power to make the zoning single family, not high density. Um, and it's not for me. I'm 66. What's going to happen with my grandchildren, your grandchildren? You, so please, when you zone, 
Don't think of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to close the public meeting here. Um, <clears throat> commissioners, maybe we should, uh, I'd like to, what I'd like to do here is uh, get a poll of uh, how we're all feeling here and uh, just uh, reiterate uh, what your feelings are and your response to what the public has uh, shared with us. Who'd like to start? David? Um, I, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, table consideration of these proposals. Um, there's, I feel very uncomfortable uh, making a vote today. I've heard a lot of information and I need time to process it. Uh, one thing that concerns me, and maybe I'm more concerned than I should be, but, but I need to know, and that is when I was given the uh, agenda items today, when I was given the packet that we're all given, the commissioners are given before meetings, uh, it says item summary. This is a city initiated annexation. Uh, I just heard Mr. Worley in response to Mr. White's comment say that this was actually initiated by the developer. So, uh, and I'm not anti development. I think people have a right to develop their property, but I'm concerned that there is an agenda here that has not been fully uh, disclosed. And as a commissioner, I feel I have a responsibility. Can you use your microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Can't hear you. Uh, as a commissioner, I feel I have a responsibility to the public uh, to satisfy myself that I have the answers to all my questions. I don't have the answers this morning. I need more time in making a motion that we uh, table further consideration uh, of this, uh, of these, of these uh, proposals. Is that, is that a formal motion? It is a formal motion, sir. We have a, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Mis Mr. Chairman, may, may I ask uh, if you're going to table it, can you table it to a date certain so that yes, we can make sure yeah. everyone understands when they can come back? Um, I think at least two weeks uh, at, our, at, a next, at our next, we're, we meet, what, twice a month? Uh, so I think we could take it up at our next meeting. I don't have We We have a motion we'll to uh, postpone these five items uh, for two weeks. Do we have a second? Motion fails for lack of, of, of a second. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. I got a question for George. Uh, George, you know, you and I sat for hours and hours and years on doing the general plan and getting it out, and it was voted on and approved. Can you just uh, mention a little bit to the audience and to the rest of the commissioners about how our general plan in the general plan for this area came about and how it relates to what we're trying to do today? Yes, sir. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll start just a step further back from that. In Arizona, local governments are required to have a general plan which includes a land use map that anticipates in broad terms what kind of developments can occur in and immediately around that community. So general planning occurs outside of the city limit lines. Um, if you look at county planning, county planning in most cases, especially in Yavapai County, actually leaves a buffer around the municipalities to allow for the local government's um, general plan to exceed the boundaries. So the city of Prescott's general plan um, from 2003 included lands outside of the city limits and included this general area a as part of the general plan with identification of roughly what the land uses should be based on what was already inside the city. Uh, much of this area in the original 2003 plan was shown for ranching or it was shown for commercial areas near um, State Route 89. When the new general plan was reviewed and approved, it actually began the process after the 2009 um, agreement for master plan for this area. So the land uses that are shown here on this, this is the general plan's land use map, correspond to those uses that are shown on the master plan in, in all cases but one minor issue, and that's on your agenda for action should you choose to do that. Uh, again this upper corner was left off of the land use plan from 2009, but it was included in the general plan's land use map. 
um, and was ratified by the voters showing residential in that area. So um, they're all based on stages and they're all based on looking at land uses as appropriate um, for the areas that are already inside the city and extrapolating types of development that can occur outside um, potentially for annexation. The reason cities do land use planning outside of their corporate limits is to allow for situations just like this. Uh, every community in the state at some point attempts to annex property in for some reason and having that land use plan already in place through their general plan makes that process much more predictable for the public. Anyone can look at this plan and have an idea, maybe not specifics, but an idea of what kinds of development could occur near them or adjacent to them. So the purpose of our land use planning is to make that, that process uh, available so the public knows. George, if we were to remove what's shown there as the multifamily, would the general plan have to be amended to remove that from that parcel? I don't think so. I don't believe the land use map would need to be amended. Um, our land uses on the land use map generally are a, a sort of a hierarchy of low intensity, higher intensity, highest intensity. And if it's designated at highest intensity, it allows the other types of uses. Our zoning is the same way. If it were zoned multifamily residential, it would still allow single family development. <coughs> A rezoning of that property to single family is probably appropriate and rezoning of that property is part of what we're asking you to consider today and make a recommendation to City Council so it's possible that you could leave the land use plan alone in the general plan but change the zoning uh, recommendation if that was your desire can this Commission then have the right to remove that multifamily from the annexation? You're recommending. You can recommend that that property be zoned single family. Okay. As Thank part you. of your recommendation to council. Thank you. Hey, George, do you have any comments? Well, you know, I consider us following a process here of which we had an approved land use map. We had an approved general plan. We have a master plan. We've gone through all of those steps. I don't see us making a recommendation to council as as us actually ever even changing anything that we're not changing anything that's already been approved previously and you know in terms of the Maldi family I live at Prescott Lakes we've got five Maldi family areas we've got production homes of 2,000 square feet we've got custom homes of 4,000 and 6,000 and our prices are higher than than most most locations for all of all of those it creates a more robust community having a mix of development granite Dells estates is getting ready to do the same thing out there with some affordable some some very <coughs> cost of hot housing you got to look at the market out there who's buying there you know like at Prescott Lakes we have 18 different neighborhoods each one has a certain character the the market is out there that supports that you don't want to have a homogenous everything two acre lots it just there's only so much market out out there for that you have a better community if you have a mixture in there so so I support all of the, these proposals so am I you know I no, I I'm fine with these plans we move it to council the conversation is to get your thoughts that's that's just fine um, I actually concur with uh, most of the commissioners here. Uh, I think the multifamily is a uh, issue in, 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 <clears throat> in, excuse me, in annexation number 002 is, is um, I wondered about it last week. I know we talked about it uh, in reference to traffic. Uh, I, I don't see why it's in there. I'd like to see it go. I see a lot of the comments were about the multifamily. So um, I think uh, despite the fact that I, th I think it's unusual to have it there I think we should respond to uh, to what the people are saying their fear is that that's going to be higher density so I too would like to see it go away uh, I don't have a problem with the process here I think this is an annexation it's not a development plan it's not a site plan 
Uh, there's nobody talking about roads where they're going to go in here. We're talking in general terms that this is our area of the city that's that uh, is, is the, the city's bumping up to this. People are moving in uh, to it and around it, and we better figure out what to do with it. George, I do have one question just to go backwards just a second. Um, and I think I'm so glad we're going to vote on this thing in separate issues. Um, because all of our discussion has been on this 300 acres and not the larger, larger one. So, uh, George, the current zoning on uh, the 320 acres in the county is what? It's, it's R1L70. The 70 is the minimum lot size in 1,000 square feet, so 70,000 square feet, an acre and a half. And we're talking, bring, and that's, and that, what's the closest city zoning to uh, that? We have a... RE two acre, which is a minimum two acre, which would be your initial land use uh, or initial zoning upon annexation. And would it be appropriate to bring this parcel in under the same county zoning density? That's actually a policy decision. I'm not sure staff should be telling you whether it's appropriate or not. It's possible, yes. Well, let, let, me ask, let me ask it a different way. What was the rationale in bringing it in under uh, 18,000 square foot lots, or two to the acre? Nearby residential district, uh, specifically Pinion Oaks, is zoned SF-18. And on the other side, on the west side, we're one house for every two acres? So we're in between the two? Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. minimal yeah. two acres? Minimum it, two acres. It, in the to the west and to the right and in the, to the, in the east. County area, that's correct. One, one is in the city and one is in the county. Got it. Right. I got it. Um, and, and just to the south of that, Longview Estates, I believe, is 35,000 square foot minimum. So right. I'd add an acre. So to the west, under. we have one and two acre uh, zoning designations. Correct. To the east, we have half acre. That's correct. Uh, I'm ready to vote on this, but I'd like to make some amendments uh, uh, to, to one of them. But uh, why don't we go through our agenda and... Um, you going to give Mr. Marshall an opportunity? You started the other end. He did. I'm sorry. I thought you did. <laughs> Every way. I'm okay. Oh, okay. Uh, you heard my views. We heard everybody's views. Separate. We heard We heard the public's views, yeah. and it's very important. And, and I'm, I'm ready to go uh, on the portion of 15002 and modify the recommendations made by staff where in item number three it says rezoning the appropriate area SS18 and MFH, <clears throat> which is medium density housing, removing that multifamily from uh, yeah. this uh, parcel ANX 15002. The motion's yeah, you know, I don't know if um, George is correct in terms of, you know, if, if you change that, then if a plat comes in that meets the requirements of the plat, you have to, we have to approve the plat. And so someone could come in with a multifamily plat if, in fact, we don't go back and change the land use map. To match the new no it's actually the zoning that would control that so if you amend the zoning recommendation to just SF 18 for the whole parcel um, any development plan that comes in has to meet the zoning the zoning has to be within conformance with the general plan but our general plans land use categories are broad uh, the multifamily uh, designation that we show in our general plan for this area allows uh, somewhere between one and seven units per acre. It's a range, yeah. so it's not a specific number, and that range would allow you to have single-family zoning within it. So the, the land use map, you can recommend to change. You can recommend to change the land use, but you're not required to. Okay. I'd like to see us uh, go to the hearing items, and if there's a motion for uh, hearing item number two, which is the annexation of... Uh, Depot Oil Ranch North. Chair would entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Nope. Chairman, before you do that, just one one point in this process. The the current master plan, this one, that leaves that portion out, 
this area. Um, if you were to recommend an, an amendment to this master plan um, as proposed to include residential for that area, it is also possible, jumping to annexation number two, that- George, we're not, not number two yet. Okay, you may be amending this thing more than once with two separate motions, just want you to know. Thank you. Now, what do you, what, are, are you ready to make a move on? I, I'm ready to entertain a motion for uh, public hearing number two, which is the Deep Well Ranches North Annexation. Right, that's the 1,304 that's, that's the acres? zero one application. Okay. You want a motion? I make a move to approve the annexation according to staff's recommendation on an, <clears throat> the annexation ANX 15001 of 13 and 4 acres of land adjoining the corporate limits of the city of Prescott. We have second. a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? I think we're ready to vote on this. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Uh, aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Do we have, uh, we'd be willing to entertain a motion for, to accept the master plan, uh, which is item agenda nine, number three, for a master plan 15 001. You ready, George? Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I clarify the process as we're going forward here? You've got just a moment. So your first approval recommendation was for the annexation. Following that is establishment of a city uh, approximation of the county zoning. That's following right. that all for is zero zero one. all for zero zero one. So if you've approved all of those items in one motion, I just want to clarify that was your intent. All of yes, those are that was okay. my intent. Thank you. Well, Sorry about that. Well, Thank the you. master plans included in as one of the four items in that is it not? Yes, it is. Ratification. That's, that's a separate issue. You have to bite. Well, it starts the 60 day. It's number four on their recommendation. Uh, where the ratification so of the previously adapted master plan for the purpose of beginning the, the 60 day uh, public comment period. So we're, that's part of the recommendation is to start the 60 day process. That's correct. And just following your discussion, is this number, t I guess it's number three on the agenda, my agenda. This is one that you're at least considering maybe amending, right? Right. Okay. I would, uh, Chair would entertain a motion to accept the master plan with the uh, condition that the multifamily portion in the southeast, southwest quadrant be uh, eliminated and uh, reverted to the single family uh, SF-18. Okay, now i got to find it. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, you are allowed to make a motion, so I assume that is your motion. Well, I'm going to make it. That is my motion. That is my motion. I'm eliminating in number three of the recommended motion the fact that part of that 300 and some odd acres, 42 acres of it is going to be deleted. That's correct. And taken away from the amendment. And take it well incorporated into the other zoning which is the sf 18. right gotcha did you make a motion if you I will, did not I'll second it. i did not you want so, to make a motion i will make the motion that we that we accept the master plan with the proviso that the acreage the whatever number of acres that is uh, currently designated multifamily on the annexation map uh, be designated single family SF 18. Right, and that's the 321 acre portion. That's annexation number, that's, that's that 15002. Right. It is, but it's all part of one master plan. I agree. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, does that also include, since you're with the first annexation, you adopted the four points um, as part of a, a single motion? Does that also points. include uh, point number three, the rezoning no. the recommendation? We're making a modification to the staff's recommendation that under point number three, rezone the annexation to single family 18 and multifamily, which is the 42 acres. We are deleting that 42 acres of multifamily land from this recommendation. From, from number three. So number four, you're also recommending that we modify the master plan. Yes. Okay. To start well, the wait, 60 day I, we may have different numbers in our agendas. Um, on the on the screen behind you, uh, the right items right the items are uh, approval of the right annexation. Here. 
they establishment of the initial zoning, new zoning, which, oh, I see what, I see yeah, what you're, you're removing at. the multifamily from the recommendation of the new zoning, yeah. and then you're amending the master plan, not just adopting it for ratification purposes. I wasn't even looking at your there's a section yeah. down here. I was looking at the agenda items, Pretty and good. what I'm proposing is an agenda item number three, which is the master plan, that the master plan be amended to eliminate the multifamily in the southwest quadrant and make it single family SF18. And that's a standalone motion. Correct. It's a standalone motion. And I will second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, chair would recommend or would entertain a motion to rezone. Uh, the rezone number 15-004, Deep Wells Ranch North rezoning of all those parcels. Uh, do we have someone who wants to make that motion? I don't see the. I don't see the see the where it has that. I don't see it, it either. They didn't give you the suggested wording, but we can. Okay. Could, could you give us the wording and the import of that motion? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead here for the, this is item number four. Well, this is recommending rezoning of the north 1,304 acres as stated in, in the agenda. You've got that, don't you, Darla? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about rezoning 15004, which is item number three. It's a little confusing. Well, it's rezone number 15004. You're looking at annexation 15001. It's That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. All right. So we're right on the right process. We're on the. It's the fourth rezoning of the year. <laughs> we're the talking about the 1,600 <laughs> northerly acres of this entire parcel. That's correct. And that we're asking for. Um, well, uh, this is 1,304 here uh, acres. Yes, that that's the piece, George. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're I believe I made I made the motion, Darla. Right. Got it recorded per the. We have a motion. We have a second. Here. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Uh, next item on our agenda is the annexation 15002, which is Deepwell Ranch's south annexation, totaling 321 acres. I thought we already voted on a motion. I, only on the annexation part of it. So you're stepping through each of the four. So we're dealing with the zoning now? Correct. Okay. So basically we're... we're I was, excuse me, I was referring to agenda number five. Yes. That's the rezoning of the 321 acres. Is that correct? Uh, I th that's why I think if our agenda you, numbers are different from a, here. here. No, the, the agenda numbers are correct. It's number five. In the staff report, each of the annexations has four points in correct. it for your motions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at agenda number six, which is the rezone, rezone number 15-005, okay. Deepwell Ranch's south zoning, south rezoning uh, of the 321 acres. Right, and we're not going to rezone it with the provision for multifamily. We're going to make a motion to rezone it all. That's certainly what I would suggest. Single family. That's certainly what I would suggest. Okay. Gotcha. And, and are we saying 18 is the minimum single family size? We're just going to make it right. all 18 and That's what the, not going to have an option for nine or six? Or We could. That could be part could, of our discussion. But if they come in with a master plan at the time that they're getting ready to develop, that they can ask for a rezoning and a master plan approval at that time. So, but taking it in under an annexation, we're taking it all in without any provision for multifamily. And is that a motion? I will make it a motion if make you want. Make it a motion. I'll second it. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion to this item? Hearing none, call for a vote. All those in favor? 
Raise aye. your right hand. Say aye. aye. Opposed? I'm going to abstain. Okay, thank you. An abstention. One abstention. Very good, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, I just want to remind uh, all of us that, uh, and, and one, first of all, I want to thank everybody. Uh, gosh, you know, these things can get out of hand, and uh, you guys just did, thank you so much. Uh, very classy, very dignified, and very professional. It made our job to hear you much easier, and thank you for, for that. Uh, Keep in mind, this is an annexation. It's just what, what's the future going to be with bringing it into the city? The, the, the details are going to be discussed over the next decades. Uh, roads, water, all that stuff. Uh, the, the plenty of opportunity. From here, uh, the process uh, goes to the city council. Uh, I don't, uh, that's where a lot of those, some of the other issues, certainly the water issues uh, that some people had can be discussed. But I want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank you all for the dignity which which you treated this meeting. And thank you, for com commissioners, for being so patient. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask George if there's any other city updates. No, sir. I would like to point out that um, we're anticipating a public hearing at council on October 6th with a potential for council to take action on November 10th. So uh, these folks will be re-noticed. Uh, of that public hearing. Including the Association for Long Beach. Especially, especially the Very Association. Good. With that, thank you all. We're adjourned. So what was the item on this? Well, no, I was, I was doing the annexation separately. Yeah, we did it in the first round.